Hello and welcome to this week's Oakcast with myself, Ian Abel. And me, Daryl Smith. Uh, this week's episode is a special edition uh, on the tribunal process. Uh, this follows on from a recent article that Daryl did explaining the importance of getting the ET1 document right if you're going to submit your own claim. So following on from that, we thought we might do a, a brief explanation of the tribunal process in general for people to understand. I will warn people that this is quite in depth and maybe not quite as um, short and brief as our other podcasts. So you may want to skip this one uh, unless you are making a tribunal claim, in which case we hope you'll find it very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we should get straight into it. And the first step to cover would be an ACAS early conciliation. Uh, so essentially, when filling the claim at the Employment Tribunal, it's mandatory that you go through the ACAS early conciliation process. This is an opportunity for both the employer and the employee to settle the matter outside of court, avoiding undue stress, legal costs and a significant amount of time, to be quite honest. Uh, to begin the process of early conciliation, ACAS must be contacted, and this can be done using the clear and concise online form that they provide. You have three months minus one day from the date of the act that you're complaining about to file a claim to the employment tribunal, but the ACAS early conciliation process will essentially pause the time taken thus far. If you're claiming against a company and an individual, such as might happen in a discrimination case, it's important that you fill out separate early conciliation forms for both. Uh, if you fail to do this, it might potentially limit your ability to claim against both parties. Once you complete the form, you will receive a reference number from ACAS, and more than one if you claim it against a company and individual. It's extremely important that you keep these safe. Usually ACAS will contact you following this via phone or email to explain the early conciliation process and what the role of the conciliator will be. Uh, me and Ian have both found quite recently that we've had to had to contact them ourselves, haven't we? I think due to how busy they are at the moment, uh, just to get the process sort of started. Uh, if the parties are able to agree a settlement with the help of the conciliator, they'll both be asked to sign an agreement, also known as a COT3 form. COT3 is a legally binding document which usually states that an employer will pay an employee an amount of compensation and both parties will agree to keep it confidential. If an agreement cannot be reached, ACAS will close this process and issue a certificate which will have the number required to submit a claim to the employment tribunal. Yeah, thanks for that, just, uh, Daryl. Just an extra bit on your, your point about a COT3 is a COT3 is a free version that ACAS will help you prepare to settle the case. Uh, the other alternative to do that would be via a settlement agreement uh, between the parties. Uh, so once you've got your ACAS number, that then allow means that you can then fi file the ET1 form with the tribunal. So you will have at least one month following the date of the ACAS certificate in order to submit the ET1. Uh, the ET1 form is available online uh, and it is basically your chance to give a clear account of what your complaint is, perhaps a timeline of the sequence of events that led up to it. And certainly the key point is to make sure you correctly articulate the heads of claim that you are claiming. So if that is unfair dismissal, if that is a form of discrimination, if you've had your holiday pay deducted, therefore an unlawful deduction from wage. Um, Funnily enough, me and Daryl had a conference with a barrister on a slightly different note uh, last week. And one of the uh, points that uh, I remember from the conversation very clearly that was in the barrister's view, um, the ET1 together with the claimant's witness statement, which we'll cover later in the, uh, on in the podcast, are probably the two most important uh, documents that you can lodge during a claim. So just again, following on from, from Daryl's article, which I would certainly suggest people read uh, and available on our website if they haven't had the chance. Um, it can seem uh, like you might be able to prepare the form yourself and save some legal costs. However, I would say scrimping at this point can sometimes unfortunately mean that you incorrectly plead your claim and you can sometimes therefore have a worse claim going forward. So we would very much suggest that sometimes a small amount of legal costs to get your ET1 checked before it's submitted can actually save you costs in the, in, in the long term and maintain the uh, heads of claim that you've actually got. Yep, and then the Employment Tribunal will copy that ET1 claim form uh, so once that's been sent across uh, and will send it to the employer in order to request whether they intend to respond or to defend themselves in the claim. An employer's response form is usually called an ET3 and upon sending this, the employer becomes known as the respondent. ET3 sets out the defence to the claim being brought forward by the, uh, by the employee to the tribunal. A time limit for responding to a claim in the Employment Tribunal is 28 days from the date that the Tribunal sent you a copy of the claimant's ET1 form. As with the ET1 form, 
ET3 has a very significant role in the claims process as this sets out the in-depth defence provided by uh, the respondent uh, and as such, again, as Ian's just mentioned, it's recommended that legal advice should be sought to complete this correctly. After submission of an ET3, the tribunal do judge will decide, having considered both the ET1 and the ET3, whether or not the case requires what's called a preliminary hearing. Thanks, Daryl. In most cases, and uh, maybe pre-pandemic, um, the chance of a preliminary hearing was relatively low, particularly if both parties were uh, represented by lawyers, because you would hope that the, the claims and the heads of claim contained in the ET1 and the ET3 would be very clear. Sadly, and I think this is a result one of the pandemic and the number of claims uh, that we are receiving, and two, because of the fact that people are doing their own claims, they're not always pleading those claims particularly well. So we have seen a huge increase in the number of preliminary hearings, which is effectively a chance for the judge to actually sit down with the, uh, the parties on the telephone, uh, usually, and actually ask the claimant, what is it you're claiming here? I, I can understand what you've, you've said in your form, but actually, is that discrimination? Are you claiming unfair dismissal? So sadly, preliminary hearings are becoming far more common. And again, in turn, they take up more of the, the tribunal's time because a judge is needed in an earlier stage. And that has then impacted on the length of time from claims being submitted until they're being heard at the tribunal. So um, we are seeing a lot more preliminary hearings due to the fact that ple people are pleading their own cases. Um, the preliminary hearing will also help the tribunal try and put a timetable in place uh, for the case management directions, uh, which we will be discussed uh, at the next point. Um, if there is a preliminary hearing, it would likely um, explain the case management uh, directions. If there was no preliminary hearing, perhaps the case is well pleaded and both parties are represented, this stage would be skipped and it would go straight to the case management directions. So case management directions, uh, there will be orders, which is uh, simply known as a case management order, uh, issued from the tribunal to try and get the case to a final hearing, they encompass the main steps of a tribunal claim. Once a case management order has been put in place, either where standard directions are issued by the tribunal or following a preliminary hearing, the parties will need to comply with this order by disclosing documents, exchanging witness statements uh, in accordance with the prescribed timetables. Usually your case management orders are pretty standard and they will follow the such. Uh, so if the case involves disability, uh, discrimination, as Ian just mentioned there, the respondent will likely be asked if they concede that disability uh, and if they do concede, the case will proceed. If they deny it, then the claimant will be asked to provide details on the disability, such as how long they've suffered from it, how it affects their daily life, etc. Uh, a list of documents will need to be provided as well. Both parties will be asked for these. A joint bundle will need to be prepared and usually at this stage there will be an exchange of any witness statements. Uh, it's very important to know, and this is something in, in a case that we've been covering quite previously, uh, quite recently, sorry, uh, that it must be arranged in advance for any witnesses to attend the final hearing. I think a lot of people um, essentially assume that by writing their witness statement they can hand it in, that's them done, but more often than not uh, they'll be requested to attend the final hearing and provide evidence on that. Um, it could include, for example, uh, further documents as well, so the claimant's employment contract, pay slips, uh, meeting uh, meet minutes, things like that. And it's open to the parties to settle claim at any point during these preparatory stages, uh, although the matter will proceed to a final hearing as directed if the matter cannot otherwise be resolved on mutual, uh, mutually agreeable terms. So the final stage uh, in the tribunal process is the hearing itself. So uh, the case management uh, directions will already set out the timetable to get to the hearing and will usually have also, the judge will have considered the nature of the claim and the number of witnesses, which will be discussed potentially in the preliminary hearing step that we talked about, which will then allow the judge to make an assessment on the number of days of the case. Um, for a inverted commas normal claim, so something like perhaps unfair dismissal and maybe with some elements of discrimination, you would expect that to be somewhere between one and three days, I, I would suggest. However, if it is a case that involves a lot of witnesses, uh, perhaps discrimination over a sustained period of time, then uh, that could easily be five days, if not 10 days uh, or longer. So sometimes they can be quite, quite lengthy a tribunal. Um, the actual tribunal itself, in terms of the hours of the tribunal, is the, uh, the the judges actually sit from 10 till 4 each day. So it's not uncommon for lawyers, witnesses, etc. to maybe meet at the tribunal at 9 when it opens. 
Uh, there are different rooms for respondent and claimant and their representatives to sit at the tribunal to allow them to have mini conferences before it starts. Um, so then uh, in terms of the judges themselves, there will be uh, one judge if it is an unfair dismissal case. If there is discrimination involved, there may well be uh, what are referred to as wing members, which will be um, lay people um, who also do the role of judges, but may um, have previous experience in employment law. So you would tend to find one of those lay members would be, or wing members, sorry, would be a pro-employer person. So that would be something like maybe a HR director or a HR representative. Uh, and the other uh, person to try and add some balance uh, to the, the, the bench um, would be someone who was seen as pro-claimant. So perhaps a trade union representative or somebody like that. And that's it for this week. Uh, a little bit lengthier than usual, uh, as Ian said, but hopefully we, we condensed that as, as short as we possibly could, really. Um, any questions about it, obviously get in touch with us. Um, we can have a read of the article that I put together as well uh, in the last week or so. Um, yeah, if you want to contact us on LinkedIn at all, uh, again, Daryl Smith or Ian Abel at Oakwood Solicitors. Thanks very much. Oakwood Solicitors, the experts in employment law claims. For any inquiries, please call 0113 200 9787 or email us at inquiries at oakwoodsolicitors.co.uk. Anything contained in this podcast is for information purposes only and not intended to be specific legal advice.